Hi, Marla. It's so good to connect. It's always so nice to catch up with you and find out what NowCab and all your members are doing across the country. Yes, Lindsay, it's so great to connect. We are so happy to have this strong partnership with all of you at Low Income Investment Fund, starting with you. And I'm excited that we're able to take this time to talk about federal advocacy priorities. Can you believe we're almost two years into the Biden-Harris administration? I know. I was just reflecting how fast times flies in these historic moments. It's really a lot of great work has been set in motion, especially with President Biden's executive order on racial equity on his first day in office. I really appreciated the tone that that set for the administration's work this past year and a half, but there's still so much to do like the Community Reinvestment Act, which is front of mind for us as public comment letters on the proposed rule are due August 5th. Absolutely. CRA is a major priority for NALCAB and our network of nearly 200 community development organizations that are anchor institutions in Latino communities. Just last month, I had the opportunity to sit on a panel at the Urban Institute at an event to discuss the proposed CRA rule. You know, CRA can be a very technical piece of regulatory policy, but at its core, it's really quite, quite simple. In 1977, after decades of banks redlining communities of color and denying us access to credit, Congress passed a law barring banks from this type of discrimination. And this law was the Community Reinvestment Act, and it prevents banks from denying credit to individuals based on where they live and instills an obligation to meet the credit needs of the entire community in which they do business. You know, I always thought it was interesting, though, that the CRA statute very clearly says that banks must serve their entire community, but the CRA regulations only measure banks based on the income of people in communities that they serve. Income is an important metric, but it's by no means reflective of real people, the most indicative metric of neighborhoods that were formerly redlined. I agree, Lucy. While there are some much needed improvements to the law included in the proposal, such as a provision guarding against displacement and encouraging greater participation and partnership with CDFIs, in addition, native and rural communities were explicitly called out, it really needs to go further in terms of meeting the needs of people of color. As we all saw when the proposed rule came out in May earlier this year, it stayed largely silent on race. It's especially surprising after so much positive momentum has been set forward with the president's executive order on racial equity. Yeah, and I've been hearing a lot over the last few months, especially about this tension within the government about trying to advance racial equity and meeting the administration's equity priorities, but also navigating the constant threat of legal challenges. You know, over the last couple of years, we've seen lawsuits against the federal government when the government tries to move forward with programs that intend to explicitly call out a race or a racial or ethnic group. Not only do legal challenges risk unintentionally setting us back in eyes of the law, but it also ties up precious federal resources in years of litigation while real people with real challenges in real communities wait. Right. And it's such a challenge to navigate. The last thing any of us want is to backslide on our progress because the consequences are very real. Lucy, I'm curious what you think about this issue when it comes to CRA. What's the right move? You know, Marla, I respect the legal process, particularly in this environment where we're seeing our fundamental rights challenged on a daily basis, but we can't withdraw. Like you said, we can't backslide. We have to advocate for CRA to explicitly name race. We know through our lived experience as Latinas, through our professional work and in the research, it shows very clearly that income is not a sufficient proxy for race. Bank redlining practices were very clear in their intent and their approach, which was to view people and communities of color as inherently risky, regardless of their financial strength or ability uh, to repay. And redlining was not about income or financial circumstances. It was about race. And we need to be just as intentional in working to repair the damage of such policies and practices. Exactly. While we applaud the coordinated interagency approach to CRA modernization, greater enhancements must be made to match the statutory intent of the law more closely. As we noted, CRA aims to encourage banks to help meet the credit needs of local communities in which they're chartered, and regulators are to assess the institution's record of meeting the credit needs of the entire community, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. Simply put, borrowers and communities of color are part of these communities, and regulators must look at the constituent parts of a community to aid in evaluating the performance in the entire community. And I think there are tangible ways we can still move forward on our racial equity priorities, even in a challenging legal and political situation like this. 
So for example, as part of LIFT's anti-racism commitments and part of the fact that we have centered racial equity across all of our strategic priorities, we have set very specific anti-racism commitments, which include leveraging special purpose credit programs or SPCPs as really powerful racial equity lending tools. Special purpose credit programs were authorized in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, which was a civil rights law prohibiting discrimination in lending, including on the basis of race. But interestingly, the law says that lenders can create special SPCPs targeted at social and economically disadvantaged classes in order to address prior discrimination. At LIF, in partnership with National Affordable Housing Trust, our affiliate, we launched our own SPCP last year called the Black Developer Capital Initiative. And one of the products within BDCI provides affordable early stage capital to Black affordable housing development firms. We recognize that Black developers don't show up with the generational wealth at scale or the access to capital to expand their businesses despite having the capacity and the experience. And so we're intentionally providing more flexible capital at better rates to these developers who may not have access to it elsewhere. And this is exactly the type of program that can be motivated under CRA so that more lenders, CDFIs, and banks are encouraged to create more targeted lending programs to advance racial equity. You know, this program that you just mentioned is a perfect example of why SPCPs are a valuable tool, and we're so glad that LIF is helping amplify their value. At NowCap, we're also emphasizing the importance of building racial and demographic data into banks' performance context. When a federal CRA examiner goes to look at a bank's CRA performance, the examiner considers the context within which the bank invested in, in community. And they use that context to determine how responsive that bank's investments ultimately were to the community. Well, we at NALCAP think an essential piece of this context is the racial and ethnic makeup of, of the community and how the bank interacts with these communities to best serve them. For example, is there a significant population of non-English speaking residents? If so, the examiner should look to see if the bank offered financial products and services in multiple languages. It's really these basic but essential questions that we have to ask in order to get to the root of justice. Absolutely, Marla. That's such a valuable perspective. And that's why I and Liv really appreciate the growing partnership with NALCAB to really get at community voice, hearing directly from those who are more deeply embedded in communities and can serve as thought partners and strategic partners um, as we develop more initiatives such as the Black Developer Capital Initiative. And I'm really looking forward to leveraging each of our perspectives as we submit our comment letters. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. It is so important that we all amplify each other in our comment letters so that the agencies know what the community thinks about the proposed rule. Thanks again, Marla, for this great conversation. I hope other partners and community development stakeholders will amplify these and other critical recommendations in their own comment letters. And don't forget to submit your letter by August 5th.